for that. Uh, Evan? Fifteen. So just this is all in the calculator. So we'll go ahead and just type the function into our calculator. And then I need to set a window on this. Probably the easiest thing to do is just to do zoom standard. Since we've been changing windows around, I see one local maximum here and one local minimum there. To find the local maximum, I'll press second and trace. Select the maximum command. It's going to ask three questions, left bound, right bound, and guess. The left bound, I'm going to pick a point over here. So move my cursor somewhere over there and press enter. The right bound, I'm going to pick a point over here. So move my cursor over there, press enter, and then enter again. So there's my maximum negative 0.092, comma negative 2.047. I think it asked around to two or three decimal places. I don't remember. Uh, two decimal places, so less than what I said. Uh, and then to find the minimum, second trace, minimum command. Again, left bound, right bound, and guess. My left bound is going to be somewhere over here. It looks good. Press enter. Right bound would be somewhere over here. That looks good. Press enter. Guess doesn't matter. So this one is 1.20 comma negative 1.22. Okay with that, Evan? Yeah. Okay. Mackenzie? 20. Okay. So this is asking whether these are odd, even, or neither. Um, this is one where I can look at this and tell right away that this is going to be a neither situation. Um, remember, I can look at the degrees of the monomials here. So I have a degree 2, a degree 1, and then a degree 0. Since all the degrees are not either odd or even, I know it's going to be neither. To prove that, though, I'll start by doing h of negative x. So when I do that, I'm going to substitute in negative x in place of all the x's. And then we'll simplify things down. This is negative x squared minus x minus 1. I note that this is not the same as h of x, so I know it's not even. If I try to factor a negative sign off, After I factor that negative off, it's also not h of x. What's up, Mackenzie? Uh, well, negative x squared is negative x times negative x, which is positive x squared. And then I still have the negative sign out front. Remember, you have to do the exponent before the negatives. So there's really three negative signs on that first thing, right? Is that okay? Are you good with that? So then this is, since it's not odd and not even, it's neither. Uh, Grace? Yep. Same idea. Uh, this one, you should be able to look at this and say that it's going to be odd. Again, we have a degree 3 and a degree 1. So since both the degrees are odd, I, I should know that this should be an odd function. I'm going to start the same way. We'll plug in negative x. When I simplify that down, I have negative 3x cubed plus 2x squared. If I compare that to the original, it's not the same, so I know this is not even.
if I factor off a negative sign, I do have the original inside the parentheses. So this is negative k of x. So this is odd. Is that okay, Grace? Sure. Uh, other questions? Cool. Uh, let me just check real quick what we left off talking about here. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> what did we leave off talking about last time? Okay, so we did asymptotes. We did function upper. Okay. That's what I was looking for. I teach this specific class four times in two days. And then I also have the traditional trig and pre-calc class two times. We're all kind of doing the same thing. So like every class, it's a matter of like, oh my goodness, where did I leave off on this one? Um, so it's just always like a consistent, uh, like, oh, did we do this yet or not? So if I ever seem like we're doing something we already did or like you seem to have picked up at a place where that doesn't seem like where we left off, feel free to holler at me because I just might have gotten mixed up as to which hour was which. Okay. So if it ever feels like uh, we've done this already or this doesn't seem like you're picking up where we left off at, just having a bad day, you know, got confused as to where <laughs> what class I was in. All right. Um, so we're going to finish up section 1.7 today. So the last thing that we had talked about in section 1.7 was these operations for functions. So addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Um, those operations, there's an obvious like analog to those with real numbers, right? We can add, subtract, multiply, and divide real numbers also. Um, there's a fifth operation of functions that doesn't have an analog to real numbers that we'll define now. That operation is called composition. So let's say let f and g be um, two functions. such that the domain of f intersects the range of g then we define the composition of um, F and G as <laughs> so the the notation we use to describe the composition of f and g is this. So this little open circle we read as compose. So when I read this line, it's like f compose g of x. That's not the letter O. That's like your multiplication dot, but it's like an open circle instead of colored in. So this is not the word fog. Do not say that because it just it hurts your math teacher's ears makes them very sad so this is f compose g of x and what this tells us is that we're going to do f of 
g of x. That basically I'm going to take one function and plug it into the other. Now the reason in the definition we have this bit about the domain of f has to intersect the range of g. Well, it basically just is ensuring that this composition is possible because what we're plugging into f is an output from g, right? Does everybody kind of see that? Well, look at what's getting plugged into f right? It's one of the outputs from G. So if the range value from G is not a domain value for F, you can't do the problem. It just basically is that little phrase is in there to make sure that the, it's possible, right? When it's possible to do composition, this is how you do it, is basically what it's saying. Um, so let's look at a couple of examples here. So here's a ex, or function f of x and g of x. Let's do a couple of examples. So let's do f compose g of x to start with. So our definition says that, okay, this is just f of g of x. And I know g of x is the function negative 3x plus 4. And when I have function notation like that, it tells us, okay, I'm going to go to my function f. And everywhere where I have an x, I'm going to replace it with, in this case, the expression negative 3x plus 4. So there the composition is done, right? We've done the composition, but there's a lot of simplifying here still left to do. So let's go ahead and finish simplifying this out. Um, according to the order of operations, the first thing we need to do to simplify this problem is to handle the exponent. Great. So how do I do negative 3x plus 4 squared like that? How do I actually do that squaring? Mia? Yeah. yeah, so you have to FOIL that out, right? That this means that we really have negative 3x plus 4 times negative 3x plus 4. So when you FOIL this out and combine like terms, I'm going to skip a little bit of the steps there and just go straight to the simplified result after foiling. I assume you guys are all good with that and can foil on your own. The next thing I would do is, if we're simplifying, distribute. yeah, distribute. So the 2 will get multiplied through and the negative 3 gets multiplied through. And then we can just combine like terms. And there's our answer. We okay there? So again, the composition part was pretty easy. There wasn't much to do there. In this case, the simplifying the cleanup afterwards was a little bit of a pain in the tuchus, but you know, eh, it's not so bad. Let's see what we get when we do g compose f of x. Well, if I apply my definition, that's just going to be g of f of x. And in this problem, f of x was 2x squared minus 3x. 
And when I have g of something, what it tells me is I'm going to take whatever's inside g and plug it into the x's in g. So that's going to be negative 3 times 2x squared minus 3x plus 4. Evan? Negative uh, 12x plus negative 12x. Okay. So here the composition's done. We just have a little bit of simplifying left to do. Thankfully, though, the simplifying here is pretty easy. All I really need to do is distribute. And there's no like terms to combine, so that's, that's that. Now, if I look at these two results and I compare them, you should notice right away that they're not the same thing, right? An important observation with composition is that composition is not commutative, that the order in which you do the composition definitely matters, unlike, say, addition or multiplication, where the order of those operations doesn't matter, right? 1 plus 2 is the same as 2 plus 1. And even if you're careful about the way you're defining a subtraction and division, the order in which you do those operations um, may not have to matter, right? If you define a, a subtraction as an addition of a negative, and if you define division as multiplication of the reciprocal, then those the order doesn't really matter. Um, now, there are some cases where composition the order in which we do the composition doesn't matter. One of those cases is a very special case that leads to the following definition. So let f and g be two functions. We say that g is the inverse function of f uh, if and only if that g compose f of x equals, I'm sorry, um, f compose g of x equals g compose f of x, and both of those give us just x. So basically what this is saying is that these two functions f and g basically cancel each other out. Right? If I take an input and I do f to it, I get some output. And then if I take that output and I apply g to it, it's going to return to me back the original input that I plugged into f. That it basically just undoes everything that f did. And that would go in the reverse order as well. If you started by, you know, f would undo g as well. Um, so this is a nice way of like that we've given to verify that two things are inverses. But how would we go about actually finding an inverse? Let's review how to do that. So 
So let's look at a couple of examples depending on the form that we've written the function in. So let's say we have a mapping diagram. It's when we talk about functions, this is usually the place we start. So let's say we have this function f that takes 1 and uh, sends it to 4, it takes 2 and sends it to 6, and takes 3 and sends it to 5. If I want the inverse then of this, I'm going to want to take 4 and send it back to 1. I'm going to want to take 5 and send it back to 3. Oh, I did that. It's so dumb. And then I'm going to want to take 6 and send it back to 2. And the name we give for that would be F inverse. So when I put that superscript on to a function, it doesn't mean like the reciprocal here. It's just a notation that we use to describe the function. So um, an exponent on a number or a variable is going to mean something that an exponent attached to a function label, right? Just to be clear, f inverse doesn't mean 1 over f, but 2 would mean, or 2 to the negative 1 would mean 1 over 2. Okay. Um, what if instead we had a, our function was a set of ordered pairs? So we just defined it very naively like this. So in our function, negative 2, we send to 4. So our inverse needs to take 4 and send it back to negative 2. In our function, we send negative 1 to 6. So our inverse needs to take 6 and send it back to 1. The function sends 3 to 8. So in the inverse, we need to send 8 back to 3. And the function, we send 5 to 8, so the inverse needs to send 8 back to 5. Do you notice anything about this inverse right here? Is it a function? No, how I not? Yeah, the x-coordinate of 8 is going to two different outputs. What about the previous example? What about f inverse up here? Is this a function? Yes. yes. Hmm. So it seems like sometimes these inverses might be functions and sometimes they might not be. That's something that we'll want to explore a little bit going forward about how to predict when something will be an inverse and when it, or when the inverse will be a function and when it wouldn't be. Oh, I was going to do a color here. So another way we can represent a function is with a graph. So let's say we want to write the inverse for this function. Well, I think probably the easiest way to do this is to kind of assign some points. So I would want to pick like some of my major landmark points. So let's say that that's the vertex and I don't know, let's say it's 0, negative 3. 
and maybe I take this point, which is negative 2, 0, and then maybe this point, which is maybe like 4, 4. So I'm going to do the same thing that we did with our set of ordered pairs. So for example, 0, negative 3 becomes the, in the inverse, would become negative 3, 0. Uh, 0, negative 2, or negative 2, 0 in the inverse is going to become 0, negative 2. And then 4, 4, well, that still stays 4, 4, right? Now, let's write the coordinates here. So the key here is that the vertex on the original is going to give me the vertex for the inverse. So the way we'll draw this is going to look something like this. What do we notice again here? Not a yeah, the inverse is not a function. I guess clean up some notation here. So that's what I think is the kind of the easiest way to draw the graph of an inverse is to try to just grab a couple of key points and then translate them just by transposing the x coordinates and then drawing your graph. The other way to think about it is if I draw the line y equals x, the inverse is the reflection of f across that line. So like this part of f, when I reflect across the line, y equals x gives me that part of f inverse. And um, like this part of f, when I reflect across the line, gives me like um, this part of f inverse, and then like this part of f gives me then like this part of f inverse. Now I think it's easier to just like transpose the coordinates to get my picture. Um, but you could do it that way too. You could draw the line y equals x and then draw the reflection. Sometimes that's a little bit challenging though, visually to kind of get that straight. But still, still perfectly valid. Everybody okay there? Okay. Um, so let's, let's take an aside and try to address this issue of predicting when our inverse will be a function or not. So we've gone ahead and found inverses in a couple of different forms, right? Whether the graph was a mapping diagram or a set of ordered pairs or a graph. Um, we can now find the inverses, but we still aren't any closer necessarily to um, predicting when those inverses will be functions and not. I mean, we can find the inverse and then look at it, but we'd prefer before we even find the inverse to know if it's a function or not. Okay with that plan? So to do that, I'm going to define a little bit of vocabulary, and then we'll come up with the rule. Um, the first thing I'm going to define is the term onto. We say a function is considered onto <clears throat> considered onto, and the alternative term for onto is the term surjective. Onto is probably used a little bit more frequently, but not that much more frequently. Um, you, if you go searching around, you may see the term surjective used in, play, in its place. Um, 
we say that it's on to if every element in the range is mapped to oops is mapped to by some element from the domain. And we'll do some examples here in a moment to kind of show you how we can tell if something's on to or not, but I want to finish these other couple of definitions first. We say a function is considered one-to-one -one and alternatively we might use the term injective. Again, one-to-one -one is probably the more commonly used one, but it's not that much more common. Uh, it's one-to-one -one if every element in the domain maps uniquely to a distinct element in the range. In our last definition, we say a function is considered bijective Oops, I forget the word is there. If it's both one-to-one -one and onto. Okay. So let's uh, let's do some examples here to kind of just make sure we understand this defin these definitions. So let's say we have. Um, this function So is this function on to why not? Very good. Yeah, so it's not on to because 6 isn't paired with anything. Right? That member of the range wasn't used. Is it 1 to 1? No. Why not? Good, because we have a y coordinate that's used more than once. Very good. Now let's look what happens if we try to write this as a write the inverse here. I'll call this F just to have a name for it. Let's see, 4 needs to go back to 1, 
5 needs to go to 2, and 5 needs to go to 3. So is this a function? No. No. Why not? Okay. So one reason it's not a function is because we have an unused domain. And another reason it might not be a function is 5 is used twice. Now notice that 6 being unused, would it be indicated if the function was on to, right? If the function was on to, all the ranges are used, so when we make our inverse, all the domains would have to be used, right? And the 5 being used twice was related to its one-to-oneness. If none of the y-coordinates are used more than once, when we make our inverse, none of the x-coordinates would have been used more than once. So what we find here is if f of x is bijective, if it's one-to-one -one and onto, then f inverse of x is a function. So this question of really, can we predict whether a function's inverse will be a function, boils down to us just determining if our function is one-to-one -one and onto. And we don't have to look at anything about f inverse to answer this question. We can learn everything we need to know from f. Um, let's look at some more examples here. Um, so let's look at some graph ones, perhaps. So let's say we have this. Is this on to? No, we have y coordinates that don't get used. Is it one to one? No, it's not one to one because I have y coordinates that are used more than once. Right, like anything on that horizontal line has the same y coordinate, right? So just like we can use a vertical line test to check if something's a function, we can use a horizontal line test to check to see if something is one to one. Everybody okay with that notion? Okay, um, so what is, what's an example of something that is, say, one-to-one -one and on-to? Well, how about just the, like a linear? Linear function is one-to-one -one and on-to. All the y-coordinates are used, and none of them are used more than once. What just happened there? Um really strange. One second here, folks. I don't know. Anyways. Well, I hope this video still looks okay. Something just happened with my monitors. I don't know. It was weird. Um, how about something that's just one-to-one -one but not on-to? What about this, right? Not all the y-coordinates are used, but the ones that are only used once. 
How about something that's on to but not one to one? How about this? All the y coordinates are used, but there's definitely some that are used more than once, right? So this one is one to one and on to. This is just one to one. And this one is just on to. Everybody feel okay with that vocabulary? Okay. Um, there is one last um, situation that we need to still talk about finding the inverse for, and that's when our function is written as like an equation. So let's say we have the function f of x equals 3x minus 7. What we do for a situation like this is I would start by replacing my f of x with a y. So I'm just going to write it so it's not in function notation anymore. And then I'm going to use algebra to get the x by itself. So in this case, I would add 7 and then divide by 3. Everybody's okay with me doing that all in one step. And then I'm just going to switch the variable name so that y will get renamed as x and the x will get renamed as y. And then I'll put it back into function notation. Also, when you divide by 3, you could write that as like x over 3 plus 7 over 3 if you wanted to. Or you can leave it as one big fraction. It doesn't really matter, Joe. I'm just confused. What did you get? 7 over 3? I, I added 7 to both sides and then divided both sides by 3. Just to get the x by itself. Just used algebra, right? Like 8th grade algebra kind of stuff. Okay, um, so we say that these two things are inverses. Is it possible for me to check this or to confirm that two things are inverses? Yes. Remember the way that we need to do that is we need to show that when I do the composition both ways, I get x. Let's do that here real quick. So the first one is f of f inverse. So I'm just going to take my f and plug in f inverse for x. So the times 3 and the minus 3 can cancel. And then the plus 7 and minus 7 can cancel. And I'm left with just x. Well, that's good. Then I have to do the composition the other way. So f inverse of f of x. So the first thing I'll do is then I'll plug in f of x for x. Uh, the minus 7 and plus 7 can cancel. And then the times 3 and divides by 3 can cancel. And I'm left with just x. 
So I got what I needed, right? Everybody feel okay kind of doing that to confirm two things are inverses? Okay, I'm just going to go grind through some more examples of kind of doing the same sort of stuff. Um, so let's say this time we have a function, say, g of x, and that's equal to 2x plus 5 over 5x minus 8. Here, getting the x by itself will be a bit more challenging because I have x's in more than one location. So the first thing that I would do is try to get rid of the fraction. So I would just like cross multiply. So that's going to be 2x plus 5 equals y times 5x minus 8. And I'll distribute the y through. And now I'd want to get the stuff with x's in it on one side and the stuff without x's in it onto the other side. So I'll subtract the 5xy over and then subtract the 5 over. If I look at the left-hand side, there's a greatest common factor of x in both of those terms. So I'll factor that off. And then I can divide both sides by 2 minus 5y. And now I have the x by itself. So when I swap the x's and y's and write that in function notation, oops, this is g, I'd have negative 8x minus 5 over 2 minus 5x. And if it's me personally, I probably do a little bit of extra algebra cleanup here. Um, if you multiply the top and bottom by a negative, you can dump a whole mess of negative signs, which is probably the way that I would end up writing it because, yo, just less negatives, you know what I mean? Get rid of those things. Everybody okay there? A bit more challenging algebraically, but the process is really the same, right? We get rid of the function notation by replacing or you know putting a y in there instead of the function notation. We get the x by itself, and we swap the x's and y's and rewrite using function notation again. Um, let's see. Again, you could confirm that those two things are inverses by doing the composition thing. Again, I'm going to skip doing that in the interest of time so I can have enough time to run through all of these other examples. That one is a pain in the butt, though, to do the to confirm that they're inverses, although still very possible. So again, let's find the inverse for this one. Again, replacing the function notation with a y. And then I want to get the x by itself, so what do I need to do first? Add 4, and then what? Divide by 3, I think I heard. And then what? Square root both sides. When I square root both sides of an equation, you have to remember to include the plus or minus.
and then we'll swap the x's and y's and rewrite this in function notation. I'm going to do that all in one step. What do you notice about f inverse in this case, though? It's not a function, right? Because of the plus or minus there. What if we had wanted to make sure that when we find our inverse that it is a function? Well, one way we can do that is by looking at our original function and restricting the domain so that the function is one-to-one. -one. The graph of my original function looks like a parabola. So if I just like x out one half of the parabola, I've gotten rid of all my repeating y coordinates, right? It doesn't matter which half of it you kind of dump off. In this case, let's assume that we're going to get rid of the left-hand half and keep the right-hand half. If I do that, all the steps are the same until I get to the this one with the plus and minus. Since I know x is greater than or equal to 0, I can drop the minus from the plus and minus because I know x has to be non-negative. So if I wanted to restrict the domain of my original function, I can ensure that my inverse is a function. Sometimes that's relatively easy, like this one was, where all we have to do is like, okay, we just need to dump one half of it. But if the function is quite complicated, this could be considerably more difficult. That's beyond the scope of this class, though. I wouldn't give you anything that was any more difficult than that, where you just have like a parabola or whatever. So, uh, if all it says is to write the inverse, then the red is fine. If I wanted the inverse function, then you would need to do what we did with the blue. So if we required the inverse to be a function, then we'd have to do some restricting of the domain. So it just depends a little on the instruction. If you did it both ways for both of them, I mean, I don't know what I would do with that, to be honest with you. I mean, it's not, it's not really like right, either because you didn't really follow that it's like a direction following issue at that point so then it's like what do I do with this I'm not really sure how, would, how what I would treat that um, to be completely honest with you Paul so it says if the directions say find the inverse red is good if it says find the inverse function then you need to do the blue because you need to make sure your inverse is a function. So just that one word difference in the direction is all you'd be looking for there. Um, I think we're on H. No. I think we're on I because we're on D, right? Okay. Letters are hard, guys. So let's say we have uh, i of x equals 12x plus 5. Again, we'll get rid of the function notation. And then to get x by itself, what would I want to do first here? Square both sides. Very good. And then what? Subtract 5 and divide by 12. And then I can just rewrite this 
or swap the x's and y's and rewrite in function notation. That one's not too bad, right? Pretty easy. So we're on J now is our letter, I think. Okay. So this next one, j of x equals negative 1 half times 3 to the 4x. Get rid of our function notation. Now we want to get the x by itself. My first thing I would do is, is what? Uh, well, I need to get the exponential part by itself before I would use a log. So I'd really need to get rid of that minus one half, right? So how do I get rid of that? Uh, Grace? Good, multiplying both sides by negative two, or you could think about it as dividing by a half. I prefer thinking about multiplication of a reciprocal when it involves fractions like that. And now that the exponential part is by itself, as Mackenzie suggested, we need to use a logarithm. Which logarithm do we need to use in this case? Log base three, the base of my logarithm, needs to match the base of my exponential. because I know that log base three is gonna cancel exponent base three. And then I can just divide both sides by four, or probably the way I would write it is one fourth times the logarithm. And then swap the x's and y's and rewrite it in function form. Good job remembering how to use a logarithm there. Again, we'll redo logs in second semester, but we've seen them before, so I'd expect that we can use them at least trivially to do something like that. Uh, K is the next letter, right? What? F. Okay, uh, our next example here, k of x is equal to 5 thirds, the natural log of 7x minus 1. Again, get rid of the function notation. And then we want to start getting the x by itself. The first step here would be to... Good, multiply by 3 fifths or divide by 5 thirds, either way is fine. I like multiplying by a reciprocal, dividing by fractions I think is kind of a silly way of writing it, but you know, leaves you more simplifying to do later if you do that route, but it's not incorrect. All right, now we gotta get rid of that natural log. Remember the LN there stands for the natural log. Uh, how do I cancel out a natural log? Or any logarithm for that matter? I need to use an exponent base. Good. For natural log, the exponent base I'd want to use is E. So I'm going to say I have E to the 3 fifths Y equals E to the natural log 7x minus 1. 
And I know exponent base e is going to cancel log base e. Notice that this e is an exponent base. That's why I've written it absurdly large to make sure that we don't accidentally confuse it with multiplying by e. I do that mostly just so I don't confuse myself with my notation. So that leaves me with e to the 3 fifths y is equal to 7x minus 1. Then I can just add 1 and divide by 7. Everybody good? So e to the 3 fifths y plus 1 all over 7 is equal to x. And then we'll put that back into function notation and swap our x's and y's. And again, if you wanted to, you could write that as like 1 7th e to the 3 fifths x plus 1 7th if you wanted to. I like writing them just as like one big fraction, but if you like writing things as like two separate fractions or whatever, that's fine. It's not a big deal. We feel okay? On doing this again this was a nice review because basically we just reviewed like the solving process for each of the function types we studied last year in our algebra 2 class it's like I almost did that on purpose like this is the beginning of the year and reviewing topics from algebra 2 might be a good idea <laughs> that was said with a lot of sarcasm you can't tell because you can't see my face maybe you could still tell and you just think didn't think it was funny or maybe you're smiling and I couldn't see your face. Who knows? It's a mystery. I often wish that like we all use the clear masks, but I also feel like those would look really creepy. Right? I don't know. It feels like it would distort everything just a little bit and be like, that seems strange. Um, okay. Let's go back and verify one of these examples now, one more of these examples, um, just to verify that they're inverses, just to get one more example of doing that. Does anybody have a preference as to which one of these examples, A through F? Well, we already did A. Let's say B through F, that we want to verify that they're inverses, just to see that process one more time. Grace, E. Cool, let's do it. All right. So E, we need to do J compose J inverse of X. And then we need to do J inverse compose J of X. So J of j inverse of x. We said j inverse was 1 fourth log base 3 of negative 2x. And when I plug that into j, j was, let me make sure I have that. Okay, there it is. Negative 1 half 3 to the 4, and then instead of x, I'm going to write j inverse. A lot of parentheses there. <clears throat> I'm regretting doing this one horizontally, as it's going to get, <laughs> it's going to be kind of long, but that's okay. Uh, so first thing I noticed that 4 times 1 fourth, those just cancel out. I know e to the log base 3, the exponent base and the log base match up. 
So that stuff cancels out. And then I have negative 1 half times negative 2. So that stuff cancels out, leaving with just the x. Yay! So far, so good, Grace. Now we just do the other direction. So this is going to be j inverse of j of x. j of x was negative 1 half e to the 4x. So when I plug that in for j inverse, I have 1 fourth log base 3, negative 2 times, and then I'll have my 1 half 3 to the 4x. Well, negative 2 times negative a half, those cancel out. Log base 3 cancels exponent base 3. And that leaves me with 1 fourth times 4x. Again, the 1 fourth cancels the 4, and we're left with just x. Feel good on that one also? OK. This feels like a good place to stop. We're right at the end of section seven. I realize that we have 10 minutes left, but I don't really want to get into section eight right now. Feels like that just would be better if it all started with that on the same day. Um, in addition, the homework set for chapter seven is the longest homework set. So at this point, we should be able to do from or, well, let's just say up to 56. So I can't remember what I had said last time, but we should now be able to do problems up through 56. Just grab that real quick. Oh my gosh, what is going on here? Let me do that. Is that back? Oh boy, that just made everybody really angry. Is that? Okay. That got everything back. And just FYI, when I make, when I do the assignments, what all I'm going to do for your homework assignment here that's slated to be due the, um, to do the fifth is I'm just going to update the numbers again. Is that okay with you guys? Um, so let's just do that right now. So that would be up through 56 then. So I'm not going to make like new homework assignments or whatever every time I update things. It's just going to like update the number in the homework centers that work for you guys. Okay. So I just I just want to make sure that we're communicating about like how I'm posting the assignments or whatever cuz it's we don't have power school where I can't make like you know a separate homework assignment for every day because I'm not storing I'm not putting a grade in for anything on power school so I can like make them wherever I wanted to. Um here since I have to assign a grade to these things I've just been like giving the due date and then just updating the numbers as I as we assign things. But we're okay with that plan. Uh, and FYI, I'm gonna the due date here is gonna be listed as um, Sunday. Considering we don't have school on Monday, I don't see any reason why the due date really can't be like Monday at midnight. So just FYI if that helps you out at all when you're going and doing stuff and you're like, oh I can just get that at Monday at midnight. Like, that's totally fine. Um, so I won't, obviously I won't check anything. And, and in general, guys, 
I don't start really checking the homework until like Monday morning when I get to school. So even if it's like a little bit past midnight or like 5 a.m. on Monday, like you're still good. You know, it's not a big deal. So just FYI, I just have to pick a time. So I just say like Sunday at midnight, but like realistically, I'm not looking at anything at midnight. You guys might have guessed that. And there's no Dropbox or anything to like record what time you actually finish the stuff at. So basically, if you've gotten it in there before I started looking at it, it's going to be fine. So, Joe? Of course. Hi, Joe. 